Hi, and welcome to Feature Fridays. My name is Guy Bartram. I'm Director of Product Marketing in VMware for our cloud providers. And today I'm delighted to be joined by Sejung and uh, Matt. So let's start with you, Sejung. Do you want to introduce yourself? Hi. Hi, Guy. Thanks for uh, having us today. Yeah, my name is Sejung Ha. I'm one of the Product Marketing Managers who looks after the Realized Network Insight Cloud, uh, which is our network monitoring solution at VMware. Thanks, Sejo. And Matt? Yeah, my name is Matt Just. I'm a uh, staff technical marketing architect for the cloud management business unit, and I focus on vRealize Network Insight and vRealize Network Insight Cloud. And that's the reason why we're here today to talk about vRealize Network Insight Cloud. Um, and I, you know, part of the kind of reason of getting you guys on here is there's, there's so much opportunity for our cloud providers to provide additional services to customers, either you know, managed services or, or self-service of um, Network Insight and just really wanted to dive into what does Network Insight do? How does it operate? Um, what sort of value can it bring to a cloud provider? Operationalizing it internally perhaps and also providing that out as a service. Um, so Sejong, let's uh, start, start with you. I think you had some slides you wanted to go through today. So for vRealize Network Insight, basically one of the needs that helped drive why customers need vRealize Network Insight is their network and just having visibility of everything. Um, you know, and of course, networks are built over time. And you know, most people who have to manage these networks, they've inherited the networks that they have. So, you know, on the left here, basically, a lot of those people have simplified their networks by going to the cloud. And whether it's, you know, native AWS or Azure or even the VMware cloud on AWS, for example, the various different VMware clouds. Mm -hmm. But uh, there's a new level of complexity because they need to now connect all these different clouds. So before they used to rack and stack servers and network gear, firewalls and everything. But now a lot of that is in the cloud. But now there's this new complexity to sort of connect all of these things, especially if they also have their own you know, private data center that needs to connect to this. Plus their users, which are on their campus networks need to connect to these networks as well. So what we, we're doing at vRealize Network Inside Cloud is taking all the information that we can grab from that infrastructure and whether it's you know, from APIs, looking through configs or um, integrations that our engineering team works with the other uh, vendors engineering teams and uh, NetFlow, there's a whole bunch of different ways we're gathering information and we're putting that all in one screen. So here on the right side is a view of how everything's connected. Every node here is something that uh, is like a different hop on the network. So we're trying to take that complexity and presenting it in a single screen that's easy to manage across you know, both the VMware ecosystem as well as the uh, you know, third-party ecosystem that most customers have, um, especially because they're multi-vendor environments. So, Sejong, so before you go on, right, uh, our cloud providers maybe, you know, already have had experience with vRealize Network Insight on their premise, and hopefully if they have seen the value it brought in terms of capturing flow information and understanding east-west traffic and all, all of that good value it brings here. Network Insight Cloud, that's the, the SaaS version of Network Insight. Is, is there any other sort of key differences between this, this solution versus the Network Insight you deploy on-premise? Oh yeah, so basically for the SaaS version, which we call the Realized Network Insight Cloud, we also have an option for um, managed service providers to also build a, a, you know, a business on it with mm -hmm. different tenants, and they can also manage their different tenants as different instances of vRealize Network Insight Cloud. So that's another option uh, that they have. And also one of the benefits of having the SaaS version is you know, there's less for a provider to manage. They don't have to install this and manage this. And especially, you know, we do uh, updates and upgrades in terms of there's new features every three months. So we, we're on a quarterly feature release. So on the on-premises version, that actually requires, you know, manual, you know, doing an upgrade. Uh, but then on the SaaS version, we take care of all that for that provider. So they don't have to manage those updates and they're 
continually running the latest functionality that's available. So I think this is, um, this is obviously great, right? Our service providers are always looking to reduce their operational burden. And the realized network insight as it was before was a deployment. There was no kind of tenancy in that model. So it wasn't something they could offer to their customers unless it was a, um, a private cloud instance with uh, the realized network insight deployed into that cloud. Uh, now with this, I mean, the only, I'm just trying to think, is there an exception where you'd want to use vRealize Network Insight on-prem isolated? Um, I guess that might be in like secure networks for perhaps uh, that don't have any external access. Um, but certainly having Network Insight Cloud, now with, as you say, the, the, the tenancy being able to have multiple customer instances um, running, that that's then something a service provider can provide as a service to a customer and also utilize for additional managed services, right? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, so basically the main use case for the on-premises is those um, networks like for the nuclear power plants, you know, for the uh, federal um, mm -hmm. type of customers that do not want to, you know, go completely SaaS, for, yeah. especially for network monitoring and, and analytics. Yeah. Okay, cool. All right. So, um, you know, so some of the three key things, and we'll talk about the th item three here today, but just to give you a perspective of some of the other things that we can do with Feverlight Network Insight uh, Cloud and is basically, you know, app discovery because the network sees everything. So understanding, you know, which VMs are talking to which VMs, you know, how, which VMs are going out to the internet, which ones are going to other resources, we can actually start to map out, um, you know, what makes an application. So this is all done by machine learning. So we can actually understand uh, dynamically, you know, once you turn on VRealize Network Inside Cloud, uh, as well as the on-premises version, you'll start to see uh, all the applications start to be mapped. And, you know, this is a key step, especially when you, when customers want to migrate to the clouds or move to a different data center. Uh, so that way you're not leaving anything behind to make sure the application is not broken, especially in these migrations. And then for the migrations, we also integrate um, using a script that's available on our um, script libraries uh, to run with VMware HCX so that all the information that's discovered during that app discovery process can be dynamically put into HCX for those migrations. But the main reason I think, you know, we want to spend today talking about, and, you know, we'll have a demo from Matt Just later as well, is to talk about the troubleshooting. And we have this new capability called Assurance and Verification that was introduced in 2020. Uh, we had acquired a company called Veriflow, and we have this new capability to do things like intent checking and things like that. And I'll cover those in a moment. But uh, the day two operations and troubleshooting is one of the key reasons why customers buy it. Do you realize Network Insight Cloud? And you know, also how we are very tightly coupled with NSX environments as well and vSphere environments uh, to help troubleshoot those, especially on the network point of view. So Sejong, before we go forward, um... So application discovery, you know, lots of our cloud providers are, are migrating their customers into their data centers or into, you know, other hyperscale environments. Um, the discovery piece is often one of the, the hardest piece, pieces to crack because you never know whether you've actually discovered everything. Um, and you know, this is giving them the ability to see what applications are talking to what application, which, you know, which other applications, um, sources and destination feeds. Um, what, what would a service provider who's using Network Insight Cloud have to deploy into a customer environment to get the application discovery up and running? Just briefly, is it just an appliance and, and configure a VPN and off you go? Yeah, it's just a VM. So basically for, you know, just for vRealize Network Insight um, Cloud to work, um, there's a collector virtual machine that can be installed locally. And then that sends information to our, you know, our the SaaS service that the customer will subscribe to. So this could be a really I, quick way for providers to do an assessment of a customer premise and get an idea of how complex that environment really is before they start quoting for professional services to migrate to the cloud. Oh yes, absolutely. You know, we'll have to do another episode on the app discovery for sure. And we'll yeah, definitely. go into more details. Okay. Yeah, I think right, one so, of the key things too, mm -hmm. 
just to call out really quick before you jump to the next slide is when you're deploying the collectors, the nice thing about the option of with the Network Insight Cloud, the platform's being hosted up in the cloud, obviously, by VMware and is scaled by VMware on the back end. So as we're analyzing data coming in from customers' environments, we're looking at flow ingestion, we're looking at metrics and so on. And as we need to scale the hardware on the back end, that's automatically being done by VMware tech support and, and uh, uh, cloud services organization, along with any type of upgrade. So we do quarterly releases. So every new upgrade is automatically pushed um, mm -hmm. by the team. And, you know, the one thing you mentioned, you know, about dropping in the collectors into the various customers' environments, the nice thing about the collectors are when you deploy those virtual appliances, they're ingesting the flows, they're doing the API calls, the SSH read-only, the SNMP read-only, depending on the data sources that we're integrating with, whether it's VMware or third party. And then that's where all your deduplication and aggregation takes place, along with the, you know, so all of the customer's uh, data that, you know, when we're looking at things like passwords and security and so on, are all in the collector, not in the platform itself, running up in, up in the SaaS offering. And then what the collector does is it basically reduces a major amount of data that is actually sent to the platform. So we're sending metadata to the platform to display in the user interface, and it's about a 70% data reduction. And then that is sent over a SSL encrypted tunnel between the collector and the platform. So just to kind of call that out, that that data is sitting there. Um, and you know, and, and if the platform was to ever lose connection with the collector, the collector does continue to collect all of the data. It can retain it. And then as soon as a connection is restored, um, then it will automatically upload that data and update the platform. So just to yeah. kind of mention that there. No, it's a really good point, Matt. I mean, lots of customers and, and cloud providers um, are you know, especially concerned about what data gets transmitted out their network. So it's an absolutely essential point, particularly now um, with you know the more the the drive that we're seeing for sovereign clouds in, in Europe and yeah. things like that. So it's, it's really critical that we we get that up front and we understand that straight away. Um, so another key thing to also talk about is the integration. So the third party integrations that we have, and it's basically to follow exactly what our customers have. So our customers have not just VMware solutions, but uh, they, you know, they have other vendors for their networking, for their firewalls, um, you know, for Kubernetes, for IP addressing, for example. So we can take all those different vendors here on the screen and actually show that on the same screen um, with the VMware ecosystem, the various different clouds that they might have as well, and show it in one screen so that they can troubleshoot their applications you know, especially for things like latency or jitter, other issues that might affect user performance. So this is the, the, I think one of the key things are these integrations that we have on vRealize Network Inside Cloud. It's, sorry, is that just me or did you just go very jittery? Oh, um, I, I'm not sure, Matt, did, but did I'll you keep hear going. I heard it, yeah, I think it was. Okay, that's, fine. that's cool. Um, so before we move off this slide, then I've, I've just got to have a question about um, these is obviously you've got a lot of data sources here that you're looking right the typical stuff you find in the network like F5, Juniper, Cisco, that type of stuff. So that's kind of the kind of the, the data source that we're going to go and get data from via APIs or whatever is available. But then you've got northbound integration by looks things into ServiceNow. So is that for, for ticketing or uh, events and alarms so we can kind of centralize that? that service desk operation? Yes, exactly. So, and also they can uh, take information from VRealize Network Insight straight into the case, for example. Oh, and good, yeah. uh, we have integrations with that. And one of the benefits of VRealize Network Insight Cloud is you know, all these different integrations are built in. So it's not like a customer or provider would have to install something special or different to add these various different integrations so that it's really streamlined. It's already built into the product. Excellent. Yeah, so, so one of the things that we've also found is we are used by multiple different personas. So whether it's the network admin or the infra cloud admin, uh, the security admin, 
And, you know, we have, you know, different rights on Beaver Lights Network Insight to see things or make different views. So it's something that can be shared across the team. It's not just the network admin who has access to this. Uh, a lot of the benefits are, you know, maybe the application team can actually see what's going on in the network before they, you know, raise an alarm saying, hey, it's a network's problem. So, so multiple teams can actually view this and what's going on with the applications on the infrastructure uh, before, you know, finger pointing starts to happen. So that's one key thing about Beaver Lights Network Inside Cloud as well. It breaks down those silos that are in you know, organizations. So uh, the different SaaS locations we have, uh, we're global. So we have, you know, one in the US, one in Canada near Montreal, uh, one in the UK in London, as well as Frankfurt, Germany on the con main continent there. And then in Tokyo, Japan, as well as Sydney, Australia and the Asia region. So pretty much, um, you know, we have a service location near, you know, every global customer. And then um, remember, this is just monitoring and, you know, running analytics. So it's not like the network is running on this infrastructure, we're just taking the networks, the network, we're just taking the information from the network mm -hmm. to provide this. So today we do want to dive into this new capability called assurance and verification. Uh, and this is basically where we're trying to let people become more proactive. So rather than having the network do something, something happens, the application breaks, something slow and reacting to that, we're trying to allow the operators to basically see what's going on, uh, creating these intent-based checks. So when things go out of bounds, they can actually, um, you know, take action before things to break down and, you know, cause a call issue or a trouble ticket. Uh, so we'll see that more in the demo, but one of the use cases is this concept of intent shaking. So that way a customer or operator could either create a custom intent or use some built-in intent. So uh, some intents could be, let's say we have a business policy that says you're not allowed to go from you know, the web to the financial database. So we're, you know, there's various different firewall rules throughout the infrastructure. And of course, people are making changes every day just to run the business. So we're continually checking to see if that intent is alive and well, you know, that, you know, we're not able to access from here to here. And if, you know, the network infrastructure has changed because, you know, maybe someone made a change inadvertently in one section, which now is allowing this business intent, which shouldn't allow this traffic to happen, then, you know, alerts can go out and people are notified. So, you know, dynamically checking um, all the business rules are still intact on the network before, you know, a uh, security issue or uh, application starts to, to get degraded. So that's something um, that we'll go into, especially in the demo part. And, you know, a quick view of this that you'll see in the demo is just, you know, the topology, you'll see, you know, different paths and, um, you know, a lot of detail. And it's just putting all the different views together from the different vendors, the different infrastructure, and you'll see um, the direction of the path, for example, as well. And do these business uh, policies kind of, um, you know, do they align to the nature of application kind of dynamics, right? The apps don't just stay still, that environment grows and shrinks. And does the business policy kind of, is it something that you have to constantly nurture and keep up to date? Or is it something that's going to proactively learn what's going on and see when new VMs or clusters are added and, and automatically include those into the business policy. Yeah. So as the network and the infrastructure grows, then, you know, the business policies are more general. So they, they'll continually apply to the, you know, the growing infrastructure. So mm -hmm. once you set up a policy saying, you know, from this part of the infrastructure to that part of the infrastructure, for example, you know, we should have this type of connectivity, um, you know, that rule still stays in effect as, you know, VMs grow or network devices on one side of the infrastructure grows. So, um, and which continually happens, you know, over time. So that's why I think the business policy checking 
intent checking is, you know, very stable in terms of uh, doing its job, basically. I think this is absolutely, uh, I mean, you mentioned multi-cloud at the beginning, but um, when we're looking at um, distributed applications, which is kind of the, the next kind of level down from multi-cloud is I've got now applications running in the best cloud for them, but I end up with a whole distributed solution where I might be running, you know, global load balances in AWS, I might be running my app in VMC, I might have my database on-prem, and I need to provide that continuity from a security and operational performance kind of viewpoint on all that application end-to-end, which if you didn't have something like this, it would be pretty hard to do, right? I mean, you, it would be a, a lot of manual work. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And also because, um, you know, each different vendor you have along the various different network hops has their own consoles and, mm. um, you know, dashboards, you would have to dive into different, different uh, screens to sort of correlate that mentally. Whereas here we're correlating all of this in, you know, this dashboard for yeah. utilize network and tech cloud. And you said machine learning was involved. I mean, that, that sounds very cool, but what is the machine learning doing? Yeah. So, so basically uh, for the, for the app discovery part, we're grouping the different VMs and grouping those VMs into the different applications and sort of mapping that out and which tier those app, you know, those app VMs are running in, like web tier, for example, uh, database tier, you know, so it's sort of dynamically mapping everything. And, you know, one thing that we also have, um, uh, you know, which is now a uh, EFT feature, but it'll be in the next release, will be, uh, it's like a dynamic, um, basically you, su- you, know, you create a subnet or you specify an address range and it will start to dynamically include those network devices into the t- topology basically. So instead of having to manually add everything, it'll also do this auto discovery process. So right. that makes it even easier too. So go and kind of crawl the network and try and find out what it can from, yeah, from all connected subnets. Right. So it's helping also in that way too. One thing that we have for um, MSPs and providers is this capability to uh, use uh, a capability in VMware Cloud Partner Navigator, where you can actually have your end customers as different tenants. So each tenant gets a instance, a separate instance of the realized network inside cloud. And then you can manage the tenants, edit the tenants, you know, remove tenants, and also sort of um, manage that service uh, for your end customer. And then also you can have different rights for the end customer either. So maybe they would get, you know, potentially read only to their infrastructure, or they can also do other changes in the realized network insight um, if you want that tenant to have that. So depending on how you want to build your practice on using Fearless Network Insight for a managed service provider, uh, we also have this capability as well. Right. So this is um, obviously then available. Um, there's an old screenshot there, Cloud Provider Hub. It's actually the Cloud Partner Navigator now, but it follows the same principles as adding any application within the Cloud Partner Navigator and um, then adding your tenants and onboarding your tenants and, and starting up the in- instance and giving them access. And this is about, you know, you can onboard that partner onto VMware Cloud Partner Navigator. Uh, and, you know, there's a process here and there's more details, you know, especially partners can click on, you know, the link there for the operations handbook and mm-hmm. that'll take them to the partner connect so they can get more details on how to onboard you this way. Yeah, so this is an MSP solution, right? So the fundamental difference is with um, our VMware kind of cross-cloud portfolio and SaaS portfolio, it's all available to our cloud partners, but it's available um, via the MSP um, route to market, which means then you have to uh, have an MSP contract and you find out more about the contract in, like say, in Partner Connect with the operations handbook for the solution, in this case, be realized inside cloud. Right, yeah, so this is one way to consume it. Of course, a customer themselves can, you know, purchase this and, you know, standalone, 
as well. And that's um, another option as well. But for the yeah. par partners, they can do it this way for sure. And then of course there's, you know, different steps to becoming, if they want to do it via this MSP process, you know, there's, you know, the different steps here that are laid out that they can. Okay, so the answer there is have a go and have a look in the guide in Partner Connect and find out where you, if you're already an MSP partner, then you won't have to sign up for being an MSP partner. You'll just have access to Cloud Partner Navigator already. It should be fairly easy for you to um, find the solution you want and get that enabled in Cloud Partner Navigator. Um, but yeah, everything is contained in the guide. <laughs> the guide is the handbook. It, yes, and, and then, you know, this is just one option. Of course, a partner could just purchase vRealize Network Insight and just, you know, run it with a license, you know, standalone license. So set yeah. of licenses. So this is just another option. Yeah. So there's, I think there's a number of kind of, and we'll dive into the kind of troubleshooting operations in a minute, Matt, but you know, when I'm, when I'm looking at what can a cloud provider do, they're going to be able to either, you know, if they've got their data center on, on premise today, uh, and even like in, you know, the customer onboarding and assessment mode, they could deploy a collector into the customer environment, get visibility on the applications, understand how complicated that customer is, because um, you're going to get a lot more um, data out of this and, and automate that collection procedure. Um, also, customers in your cloud today, drop a collector in there um, and you get visibility of all of the uh, networking and security and applications in the SaaS solution. Um, but the other, and you could then provide that as a managed service. So if customers wanted to understand their kind of network security posture and, and traffic going on in their network between their applications, uh, I presume there's a kind of reporting capability in the Realized Network Insight where you can generate reporting that on particular segments or particular customers. Yeah, th Does there's it. reporting um, per instance. So I don't think we have a reporting like from the partner navigator view, like for everything together, but you can definitely do reporting, you know, per instance, like go into one instance and run reports. Yeah. So you could use that as part of Matt, and we were talking about security before and, you know, keeping that data on site. So getting the trust with the customer from a security standpoint and proving to them, you know, their network traffic is secure and this is what's talking to this. I, I think that's a major kind of upsell for a cloud provider to deliver that differentiation to their customer. Absolutely. All right, yeah. cool. So um, I think we're, we're at demo time, aren't we, Matt? Yeah, yeah, let me go ahead and share my screen. Okay, so um, what we'll do is I'll uh, jump into uh, covering some of the use cases that Sejong was covering there in the slides and discussing, as we mentioned, around network assurance and verification. Um, it incorporates uh, a, a couple uh, different elements uh, as far as the feature set goes. One is going to be what we refer to as the network map, which is pretty self-explanatory. It's actually a full infrastructure map, which I'll touch on, that's going to allow us to see visibility into our virtual and physical infrastructure as a whole um, among being able to do a lot of other different things that, um, within the infrastructure. We also have what we call intents, which was mentioned. So this allows us to define intents that um, run against the system and look across the entire infrastructure, both physical and virtual, um, to analyze based off of the business policies or just it could be even best practices like MTU checks or um, looking at things like FIPS and dealing with, uh, uh, you know, um, compliance around password compliance and so on against the system. So, in which, and I'll, I'll dive into that. And then we also recently uh, released uh, in our um, most recent release and in, in we realized Network Insight 6.5, we've added support for uh, what we call guided network troubleshooting, which also falls under the network insurance and verification um, that actually kind of uh, dives in from a high level, lets us uh, you know choose either an application or a virtual machine and go through and determine, you know, is there an issue? And if there is, you know, which, it, you know, Network Insight will automatically tell you if there's an issue, it'll guide you through in determining what is the issue? Is it, you know, uh, related to uh, overlay? Is it related to underlay, you know, and try to pinpoint it down, you know, is it, is it a, a latency problem? So uh, it's a very uh, powerful tool that can help um, uh, 
service providers uh, doing troubleshooting within a customer's environment when they have application performance problems and so on. Mm -hmm. Now, within the actual network map here, so I'll click into the network map, and this is going to uh, put up a uh, network infrastructure that we have. Uh, this is actually um, a infrastructure that is deployed um, in our, our demo infrastructure here. Um, as you can see uh, from a high level, and I'll zoom in on these in a second, we are looking at basically uh, physical infrastructure. So we've got things like uh, firewall. This is a Palo Alto firewall, an F5 load balancer. We've got multiple routers and switches in the infrastructure uh, of various vendors, uh, just to show the multi-vendor uh, capability here. So I've got Nexus 9Ks, some Arista 7050s. I've got Dell S5248s. Um, so various different vendors that are uh, integrated for our underlying network infrastructure. And then our overlays, which are gonna be represented by the various uh, rectangles and, and squares here that are our ESXi hosts. So these are, each one of these rec represents a host and they could be running something as simple as just a standard virtual distributed switch like this one down here. Um, the, or they could be running NSXT, let's say as an overlay. And we're looking at the uh, various uh, tier one, tier two, or tier one and tier zero routers that are deployed uh, distributed, distributed firewalling and so on. Um, and then looking at, you know, performance at the edges and so on within the NSX infrastructure as it correlates to the underlay physical infrastructure. So as down here, you'll notice we've called out different icons and kind of gives us a, an idea of, you know, what we display in, um, in regards to both physical and virtual. You also get an overview above of basically all the alerts that are going on within your infrastructure. And these are all um, scaled out based off of the level of severity, uh, which are uh, they could, out of the box, we'll have predefined severity levels, but um, the service providers can, can go in and adjust those if they feel they need to be more critical based on the customer's need, the tenant's need, and they can uh, adjust you know, what's you know, more severe, less severe, and so on. So that's all fully customizable. We also break it out and show things like how many switches are in the infrastructure. So when, we do, when we're calling out switches, this is including both uh, layer two switches in the physical underlay, and it's also including logical switches running in NSX. So mm -hmm. as, as we have the logical switches deployed, so we kind of group those into uh, one category. Same goes for routers. That's both you know virtual and physical routers. We're also looking at firewalls. Again, that could be physical and virtual, distributed firewall, north-south, uh, uh, tier, uh, tier zero firewall. Um, it could also be uh, running you know, like things like our Palo Altos or checkpoints and so on within the infrastructure. Same thing goes with load balancing, uh, transport nodes, and other entities within the infrastructure. And now, as we take a, uh, a look here, you'll notice also that we have the capability of uh, toggling on alerts, which we can toggle on and off within the actual infrastructure. So if I zoom in here, you'll notice as an example on this Palo Alto firewall, you see this red triangle. So that's indicating that there's we're detecting either an issue or an intent that's failed, um, or uh, it, you know it could be a configuration change that you know is, is being flagged. So you do have the capability of toggling those on and off depending on how busy your network map is, how large the infrastructure is. Um, if you want to be able to uh, just have little indicators and you can go and click in each one of these devices to look at those alerts uh, as one option. We also, the uh, customers can also uh, totally customize how they want their network map to look. So we have the uh, edit mode here. So when you do um, your deployment, you know, we auto discover all the links. We're looking at things like LLDP and CDP um, connectivity. Uh, determining layer two, layer three um, connectivity uh, on top of the data that we're pulling from the devices to look at things like routing tables and MAC tables and ARP tables and consolidating all of that. So you can come into the network map here and you can simply just, if you want to edit, you can just click on uh, any grouping. Everything's all dynamic, so you can position everything on how you want it to look. Um, you can also do uh, grouping. So you can click add a group. You can provide a name. You can choose which entities that you want to include inside that group. You can choose a color to represent that group. And then once you hit submit, what it will automatically do is take those devices, whether they're virtual or physical, and group them into what we're seeing here. Like you see, I've got my backbone group that is uh, consists of 
uh, some routers and switches. And then I've got my access layer group here, which is uh, some other uh, switches that are deployed. So you can create groups as many as you want and group devices, um, and then be able to also just click on the entire group, but you can come in and click on the entire group and you can move the whole group around. Uh, so you can customize the map, uh, pretty flexible um, into any way that you'd like. Um, and then we also have an auto layout um, where when it first deploys, when you first deploy Network Insight, it will automatically do a top-down approach, um, putting the network devices at the top, the uh, underlying devices in the, uh, uh, um, I'm sorry, the underlying networking devices on top, the overlaying devices and the host down on the bottom. So you can also use the auto layout feature if you don't want to you know, go through and build out different uh, groupings. So you can come in again, fully customized. You can edit um, uh, the network map and create different groupings for devices. The other thing, uh, so I'm going to cancel on that. And I'll jump into our full screen mode because this gives us a little better visibility onto what we're looking at. So the other thing that we're going to take a look at here is, so you know, as I zoom in, and I mentioned, you know, we can see the more you zoom in, the more detail you're going to see. Um, so what we have here is, uh, you know, different groupings. Again, I mentioned that I've got various underlay devices. So these are my Nexus 9Ks um, that are connected to ESXi host. So I can see the ESXi host here. And then I can see the, the, the various components uh, running on that host, such as the virtual distributed switches. I can also see tier zero routers, tier ones. Um, I can see the, uh, the VDS associated, so on. And we even support N NVDS. So depending on you know, what version of NSX might be deployed in the infrastructure. Now we don't, um, so from a uh, NSX or actually from a uh, overlay perspective, you don't necessarily have to be running NSX in the customer's environment. Again, from a virtual infrastructure standpoint, it could just be a simple virtual distributed switches with uh, that have port groups with VMs connected to them. So, which is an example on this host here, where we're not running anything, no NSX in the overlay. So um, you can simply have that connectivity. And then every virtual machine that's associated to these uh, or connected to these, I should say, um, are represented in the network map. We obviously don't show all the virtual machines because I'm at that, that would be just you know a lot of uh, icons to display on the screen. So, um, but they are, we do, uh, when we model these out, have the connectivity to each one of the virtual distributed switches or depending on the tier one or tier zero, depending on how the infrastructure is deployed. So let me just zoom out a little bit here. Now, the other thing to call out is you can come over and you can click on alerts. And what this is going to do is this is, again, as I mentioned, you can toggle alerts on and off. This is going to allow us to go through and take a look at um, various different alerts that are happening within the infrastructure. And again, this is the infrastructure as a whole. So um, you can come in and you can expand um, on many uh, different alerts to look at and see what's going on. As you can see, I've got some reachability failures. Um, there's 50 alerts grouped under each of one of these categories. Um, we've got uh, some addi additional alerting that's going on. And then what these are doing is these are kind of showing me whether it's a uh, intent that's being checked, such as like a segmentation or a reachability uh, intent, looking for like things like native VLAN mismatches, analytic threshold alerts, uh, segmentation failures that uh, could be, you can self-define an intent saying, hey, point A to point B should be segmented. And that could be virtual, could be VM to VM. It could be looking at it from a virtual router to a physical router. Uh, you know, other things could be like, for instance, if I wanna isolate my, uh, my data center from my uh, DMZ as an example. So we can get very granular and I'll touch on that with the intents. And when these alerts come in, this is where you can come in and you can take a look at each one of the alerts to see what's going on. And I'll dive into that here when we when I uh, go through and kind of demo um, some of the pathing capabilities. You can also come up and quickly search for alerts right up in the top here. We have a, a search bar if you're looking for specific type of alerts that you want to focus on within the infrastructure. The other um, thing that I'll call out and, and it will show here is going to be based around we have entities and then we have the pathing option. So when we look at entities, second here, my mouse is, sorry, it's taking a second here to click. Does it think you're still in search? There you go. 
Yeah, yeah. You know, I'm always impressed, uh, Matt, Matt, with with the views that you're showing because it's almost like you're this network deity, and you can look up from this view, and then as you're zooming in, you can see, you know, just the links Perfect. and all as much micro detail as you want. So it's always really cool. I remember when we used to draw this manually in Visio. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I spent 20 years, I've been as a, working in the network industry for over 20 years and doing all that and trying to auto map out everything. It's just, this, the, yeah, I wish I had this tool back when I was doing that. So, um, but so to continue on, like when I click on entities, you can also come in and you can search for entities. We also will group things like by entities with problems. So basically what we're, this is doing is it's showing you that there's 55 devices and those could be, uh, these are hosts, we can see uh, routers and switches and so on um, that we can look, look at. And each one of these has a, uh, a detected issue or an, a, 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 it could be an analytic issue, a threshold, it could be an intent that's failing. So we can click into these to see what's going on with each one of these devices to determine what is going on uh, if I just wanna focus on devices that are actually having issues. We also can just click on all entities and that's gonna show us everything that we have within our infrastructure. And that's also displayed in the network map. You can also come in and uh, just search for things and you can do it like by vendor if you want to. Um, let's say I wanna go in and I wanna find anything that I've got that is uh, Cisco in my underlay infrastructure. So I can come in, I can do Cisco, I can do search, and now it's gonna show me I've got 17 Cisco devices deployed within my infrastructure that are also being displayed in the network map. So if I come over to one of these devices here and I can take a look at that device, I can see each ethernet interface, whether the status is, uh, the interface is up or if it's down, I can also click and expand on the interface to take a look at data uh, around that interface, to look at how it's configured, what's its operational status, the administrative status, what VLANs are configured for that interface, um, what VLANs uh, are allowed to be trunked, uh, the MAC address, the MTU, what speed is it running at, um, what type of device is this, uh, native VLAN configuration. So we look at native VLANs and native VLAN tagging. Duplex, we're also looking at what the device is. So this is a, on a Nexus 9396. And then the manager is going to be the switch itself. And then if I wanted to dive even further in and look at analytics, I could just click on to the Ethernet one here and this will open up. And this is now going to allow me to see the configuration data for this interface. So I can go through and look through that configuration data. And then I can also come over and look to see if I have any alerts um, that are active, which I don't have any on this interface. And then we can also look at the switch port metrics. So this is where we can look at things like overall throughput, we can look at uh, uh, network receive, transmit, overall tra uh, traffic. We can look at drop packets, interface peak uh, buffer utilization on the device. So you can come in and you can choose and you can have as many different graphs as you want to graph out data. Now there's no traffic going over this interface because it's just a management interface. So at this time, so we're, you know, we're not seeing any data. We're, you know, minimal right here, like about eight kilobits per second on the transmit side. So, but what you can do is you can totally customize these and then also adjust the time frame since we are a time machine storing all this data for data retention. So you can look at it over the last day, you can come in, you can do custom, you can specify between a time range, or you can go back, you know, 30 days, you know, whatever you want to do, depending on what you have your data retention set at to do analytic studies and, and uh, also look at, you know, previous uh, troubleshooting incidents that may have occurred to see what happened at that time and, and what was, uh, what was done to mitigate that issue. Hey Matt, how, how far back does the data retention go before it starts rolling out? So it depends on the type of data, uh, but primarily we can, you know, right now we can currently support up to 13 months. Um, it, it, you can expand it and it, it is customizable, obviously, on how much you want to retain. Uh, so when we look at like metrics and, and uh, analytics and so on, we're looking at like a 13 month period. Um, configuration data that we're pulling from the devices that we use to analyze to determine the connectivity between like, for instance, the layer two, layer three, and so on. Um, that's going to be up to three months that we'll hold the, the configuration and then we're, but we're constantly refreshing that. So we're constantly yeah. pulling data and updating that. So we'll retain that for three months and then flow data currently we retain for, uh, uh, for one month on the flow data collection and the flow data is basically, you know, we're not just sampling flows. We're actually 
ingesting the full flow one-to-one. Um, so we take the flows in and ingest them and then do the aggregation deduplication. Um, and then we'll store the metadata based off of the flow. But the actual flow records themselves are stored for one month and then it's like a first in, first out type thing um, hmm. as the flows are rotating and coming in. Okay. Now, you can also just simply click on any of these devices and it will snap right to it in the network map. So it makes it really easy to kind of find the device. So um, you can look at the interfaces or I can just come over and click on entity details for the entire switch or router. And here I can see on this Nexus 9K that I clicked on information about the actual switch. I can see things like the switch port table, what is the status of each interface and configuration, you know, things like what VLANs are provisioned on each interface and allowed. Um, but more importantly, when you look down here, now I can take a look and see, and you know, some of these are aged just because for demo purposes, but what you're looking at is these are issues that have been detected on this device at one time um, that either have been corrected, that we've just left that active, or that, um, or maybe left on purpose. So like, for instance, when we look at link MTU mismatches, we can expand that. And what we're looking at is we're looking at the device, the, the switches uh, interfaces, and we're looking at the MTU configuration. And then we're also looking at the peer device that it's connected to, to see if the adjoining interface has the same matching MTU. Like, let's say for instance, if you're deploying NSX and you wanna make sure that you've got jumbo frames enabled, to support the Geneve protocol overlay, um, you can go through and take a look to see and, and do a comparison if it's set on the host, if it's set on the switch that it's connected to. So these are kind of taking a look at, for instance, you know, the ESXi host, the default MTU for, uh, for ESXi is going to be 9,000, whereas on a, a Cisco, they set their, um, if you enable global um, uh, jumbo frames, it's going to go to 9216. Now these are both jumbo frames, so I can come in and I can just say, you know what, that's fine. It's just how they, you know, the numbers that they use, you know, based off of the vendor. And I can just simply click archive on the event, and then I can provide any information I want, uh, choose about the alert, hit save, and then now that event is cleared off of that device. That's so many cool. different ways. To, Sorry, that's, yeah. that's a pretty cool feature actually, just to, cause I, when I saw you suppress that event, uh, mm -hmm. you actually were able then to suppress it for that device or suppress it globally? Yes, you can choose globally if, it, you know, if you want to do it globally or if you want to do it, uh, you know, by event by event on each device, you absolutely can do that. Yeah. But you'll see here, there's a long list of various different things that, you know, we're checking spanning tree, underlay device, LLDP neighbor. Um, if a device gets removed, you can see off Ethernet 128, there was a device uh, that was disconnected. Um, so we're not seeing any uh, neighbor relationship there. Trunk VLAN mismatches, um, switch port down. So uh, all of these can uh, these can generate alerts that can either be sent locally in the interface via email, via SNMP trap. And then we also added support for pu push notifications now. So we can just like your iPhone and you get a push notification, we, you can do push notifications within VRealize Network Insight on a per event basis, you can you can choose which events you want to be notified via push notification. And Matt, if now, I wanted to kind of raise a ticket from this type of stuff, how how easy is that for me to do in, in terms of like, you know, lots of service providers, they use, use ServiceNow. So yep. um, how would I just kind of, is there a right click and raise ticket or? Um, no, not necessarily. So basically what we do is what, the way that uh, from the ServiceNow standpoint, and other ticket ticket systems that are used to uh, that a lot of customers use is we use integrations with them either via SNMP email um, and so on. And then we also have what we call data bus. So data bus allows us to have subscribers subscribe to the data bus feed on VRealize Network Insight, and you can have multiple subscribers that are constantly pulling live data off the data bus. Yeah, right. So that uh, um, utilizing those types of interconnections allows the integration with things like, with companies like ServiceNow for ticket generation. And then the data that we provide included in the alert is baselined in the ticket and you can start to see, you know, okay, hey, um, you know, I've got a switch that just went down. Uh, it's located, you know, here, here, and here, or here in this device, you know, this is what happened. Um, so we include data in each alert to kind of give them a guidance as to where to start looking. But obviously, once they um, launch into Network Insight and go to that device, they get more detailed um, analytics and, and guidance on what is causing the issue. So is it is it customizable? So just to ask this again, like if I created my 
grouping around a customer application or components that application kind of relies on. And there's an instant with I don't know, excessive latency, perhaps on, on a link that's impacting the application. Would it, can it then take when you, um, when you're looking at the data that's published to the bus, the group would be a part of that data, I assume. So you could say, see immediately it's a customer affecting um, incident. So it's not going to be so much necessarily to the group. What it's going to be tied to is it could be associated to an application itself. Um, it could be associated to us uh, individual flows. So when we're looking at latency, we're analyzing the TCP round trip time across the flow or for each individual flow. Mm -hmm. So it, you know, um, as, as you, you know, as you're aware, there could be many different flows coming out of a virtual machine as an example. Um, and if one of those flows starts to experience high latency because of its destination is let's say, you know, across the world, somewhere in China, as an example, um, and we start to see high latency, then we're going to alert on that individual flow and include the information that's going to tell you which VM, which application is it associated with and so on, so that you can easily see that and figure out what's going on from there. Okay. Uh, the group, not, you know, when I talk about groupings, I'm not, it's not going to absolutely come and say like this group here or, you know, backbone, um, it's going to be the device and it's going to include, you know, the information around those when you, when you, uh, uh, receive those alerts in, in our today's uh, data bus feed. Okay. The other thing uh, I'll touch on here is when we look at paths, so paths is, you know, a powerful, what I, I like to call kind of like a uh, trace route on steroids. Um, so what we're doing is because we're ingesting all data across both virtual and physical from a configuration standpoint, and, you know, across all the state tables on all of the devices, it allows us to provide full layer two, layer three visibility, including into firewalls, both, let's say, NSX distributed firewalls or Palo Alto, Checkpoint, Cisco ASA, Fortinet, you know, third party vendor firewalls. So we're, because we're analyzing all of that along with ACLs that are configured, um, you know, could be configured on a router or a switch, it allows us to come in and map out the source and destination. And you can get very granular in how you want to do that. You can come in and you can choose a source port and a destination port. You can also choose a specific protocol that you want to see if there's path availability or if a path is blocked by, let's say, a firewall rule. So you can come in and you can choose many different protocols. Um, you can also come in and choose path type. So whether it's a primary path, a backup path, or all paths. So if you're running equal cost multipathing in your infrastructure, then from a routing perspective, you can look at your primary and your backup paths that are available. We also do traffic direction, whether it's forward or bi-directional, depending on what you're, you know, you're more interested in looking at. And then from a path status, this is going to provide us visibility into either I can look for all paths, I can see what's reachable or what is blocked. So if I, you know, depending on what I'm trying to uh, determine, you can also add in additional hops. So when you click add hop, I can also check from a source to destination via a specific hop if I want to see if there's connectivity, reachability, or segmentation, as an example, depending on the use case. So in this example, what I'll do is I'll just choose uh, some virtual machines. So I've got virtual machines. These can also be VLAN to VLAN. It could be physical device to physical device. You can get you know uh, granular down to the VM level, or you can do it down to the interface level, or the VLAN level, or the device level, or even look at it from a grouping perspective, like DMZ versus data center devices and look at it as a whole. But what I'll do is, so you just simply can come in here and you can start typing and it will do suggestive search as, it, as you start typing. But basically what I have here is on the, the um, source um, and destination, I'm gonna specify my virtual machine. So I've got nav, pause for a second because the system for some reason is running it slow. Come on. I almost have high usage today. This demo system is used by all the uh, SVs at VMware globally for demoing to their customers. So sometimes it can put a heavy load onto it. Don't worry, we'll make it look quick. Yeah, okay. So again, um, with the source here, I'm gonna start specifying uh, the virtual machine that I wanna focus on. So I'm gonna do nav dash, uh, we'll do uh, web, uh, 01, and then uh, my destination, I'm going to 
uh, do nav dash uh, look at from like a, a web tier uh, uh, or a web VM to like, let's say a database VM. And then basically what we're gonna do is click show paths. And it's gonna go through and check all of the configuration data and the analytics. And now what it's doing is now we can see here, here's my source IP or the virtual machine name. The, I didn't specify any specific source port, so it's looking across all ports. We also have our destination and our destination port, and then the protocols, which is including is TCP and UDP. Mm -hmm. Now in this case here, and I'll just kind of zoom out a little bit so we can see this. So when we're looking at the network map, you can also see the paths that would be available in the traffic direction utilizing these arrows. So this would be bi-directional traffic. Um, so we'll indicate if it's forward or, or bi-directional. Now, what you'll notice here is these are dotted lines. So what this is, is because all four paths between my web uh, front end and my database back end on the specific application are all blocked. So even though that the path is blocked by, let's say, a it could be like a distributed firewall rule, we will still model out what the path would look like, even if the path, uh, so if the path was, let's say, to be unblocked. So you know which direction it would take, which uh, overlay devices would be traversed, which host to host, the underlay, again, that you're gonna see here that could be utilized to route or forward, depending on if it's layer two or layer three. And when I click on each one of the available paths, what it's going to do is give me that full detail. It's gonna show me the forward path and the reverse path, and it's gonna allow me to do a hop by hop walk. So I can see uh, where I'm starting off on my VLAN, uh, or I'm sorry, on my VM. I can see the source and destination MAC address, the IP address, the destination, the protocol. I can see it's starting at the virtual machine. I can see that there is a ACL applied. Um, and then it's, you'll note here, it says, if allowed, traffic would continue as follows. So that's where that dotted line goes. So then we can go through hop by hop and we can see you know, what's, what would be the end interface. It's being layer two forwarded. It's going out on the, on the host. We're seeing we've got a packet header change that's occurring on the uh, web interface here, um, coming in on uh, the interface, uh, on the in interface, it's running layer three at default. We can see the packet header change again for the source and destination going out to uh, the database. And then as I go through, I can see the things like the NVDS in this case, the in and out, the encapsulation. And then this is where we're encapsulating to go over the Geneve protocol or utilizing Geneve and NSXT. So it's actually telling me that it's used, utilizing VLAN 2004 in the underlay. It's giving me the ethernet uh, MAC address on the destination, the source and destination IP address. Here's our protocol, which is using port 6081, which is Geneve. Here's our virtual network identifier. And then as we keep going, we can see it's encapsulated, the in interface that it comes in on, where it's actually changing. It's using layer two forwarding on this. We can see the physical networking device and the underlay, which ethernet interface the traffic is coming in and which interface the traffic is going out as it goes all the way to our destination. Now, to, what's important to call out is we know these paths are blocked. So if I wanna determine why are they blocked or what's blocking them, I can see the ACL here. So I can go ahead and click on the ACL. And what this is going to do is show me what is blocking it. Now, in this case, we have a distributed firewall rule that's saying web should not be able to have access to DB. That's typical, you know, best practice. So what we've got here is we're seeing actually the sequence ID, the source, the destination of the firewall rule, the service, the action is dropped, the rule ID. So it helps identify the distributed firewall rule ID the NSX manager, which direction it's applied to, what where it's applied at the distributed firewall, what ports it's including, and then it, other data that we're pulling, such as you know uh, section name, status, and so on. And then I can also see what it, what the rule is applied to, and this happens to be applied to at the logical switch level, so I can see what what logical switches it's actually applied to. And if we were to have multiple packet headers, you can come in and you can change packet headers and so on. Um, to be able to look at the various information. So this is actually showing us exactly what is blocking the traffic. It's awesome. Path, and we could do that for all, for all of our paths, yeah. yeah and so, then you um, see your back. Oops, sorry, go ahead. Sorry, just want to, so this is, um, this is amazing because it's kind of taking an offline view of how the network should react and, and identifying exactly. what blockers are, like you say. What about um, uh, dynamic routing protocols? I'm sorry, dynamic 
what routing protocols and and you know the, oh. if a, a backup changes or a primary changes and the route changes how quickly yeah. does this system kind of identify that very quickly so we're right. because we're analyzing all of that data you know we're looking at bgp we're looking at ospf you know uh eig eigrp depending on the vendor and what pro protocols yeah. are be uh, run or ran we can also see those and study those and that's why these backup paths are indicated here these yeah. are actual across multipathing across different uh, using BGP actually in this setup where I can actually see the backup paths that can also be used if I was to change um, change path to utilizing the routing protocol. So we will break yeah. all those out. Yeah. You can look through all those um, and have full detail. That's so a it makes it very nice. Yeah, yeah, it is. It, it, it helps you to analyze and, and also it makes you to uh, help to determine. What if I was to go in and make a change, you know, somewhere and I want to look and see what, you know, what gets impacted. All of this data that's here is very powerful for you to be able to choose or determine what a change in the infrastructure would look like if I was to modify any of this configuration that's currently in place and in state. Now, the last thing that I'll touch on here is um, the intent. So the intent dashboard, which is associated with the network map, is a dashboard um, that allows us to see what, how many intents we've got deployed, what are our failed intents um, across various categories around network health, device health. Um, if there's SD-WAN in the infrastructure, we also integrate with SD-WAN, so we, we have intents there. I can see alerts by category. I can also see by severity. And then we have a list here of all the different intents that we have set and configured and that we're checking across the system. So it gives us the type of intent. So we see we've got some SD-WAN uplink performance and application performance, MTU mismatch, segmentation, reachability, uh, many different intents, native VLAN. So you can come in and uh, create intents. And then there's also out of the box intents that the system will run against just from a, a best practice standpoint. And you can specify details about that intent. So as an example, here's an intent that says the nav web tier should be segmented from the nav DB tier. So um, this intent here, which I can actually see is failing and uh, we can see the alert. Now, what I'll do is when I click on this, you can click on the actual alert. And this is actually that path we just looked at. So when I look at this, it's actually telling me that there is a segmentation issue. Now, when we looked at that, we saw that the paths were all blocked, mm -hmm. okay? When we looked at it, but when, we're, when we see that there is an issue between uh, the source segment, which is our web VM to our database VM, bi-directionally, um, it's telling us that that's failing. And they may be like, well, okay, we checked that, that's all blocked, why is that failing? So if I click into, and I'll just switch back up here into the network map, and I go back to my alerts in the network map, I can go and take a look at that specific intent and what is going on with that intent. So let me go ahead and uh, click show more here really quick. And basically what, what's happening, so what we see here is I can see that I have a segmentation failure that came in two days and I've got three alerts. So if I go ahead and click into the alerts themselves, I can go ahead and I can expand these to take a look at each one of the, where I actually had segmentation failures. So let me go ahead and click here and this will expand and show us our uh, segmentation uh, failures that are occurring that have uh, tripped against the intents that we've selected. Okay, so now we have our segmentation failure that we're looking at here and we expanded the three alerts and I can go through and I can see different areas where I've got segmentation intents that are failing. Now, the one that we're gonna take a look at here is we're gonna focus on that Web01 uh, to DB01 that we did look at the path on and we saw that the four available paths were blocked, but the intent is still failing saying that there is a segmentation issue. So what Network Insight is doing is it's also taking analysis on the back end and determining whether any physical or virtual device within the infrastructure could possibly spoof an IP address to, cause, to, to be able to allow a, you know, C2 execution of command and control and move laterally within the system. So what, what I'm seeing here is I can see that it's showing me that the source segment and it's saying nav web01 to uh, my, you know, my database that I check bi-directional. And then when I look down here, I can see that there are paths that are not backed up. And what when I look at the source IP address, this source IP address to my destination IP address, which is my, my DV, 
can be utilized as uh, because there's not uh, um, spoofing uh, spoof guard enabled uh, within whether it's in NSX or if it's at the uh, a physical firewall level that could allow that IP address to be utilized as to spoof and act as uh, uh, the Web01 uh, virtual machine and actually find a path. And we can actually look at those paths. So this becomes very powerful from a security check uh, standpoint to look and see if we have spoofable IPs within our infrastructure. This IP address happens to be the app, uh, the app um, virtual machine in this same application that uh, could be utilized because there's no, there's no spoof guard enabled to um, utilize to actually spoof the IP address and then uh, access and have access to the back end of our database that we're interested in. So this is showing us the various uh, paths and the various different IP addresses that could be utilized uh, in the past that could be utilized to actually spoof um, uh, that Web01 virtual machine that we're actually focusing on. And that is why the segmentation intent is failing. So this would, you know, we could use this to go and enable spoof guard or other um, uh, security controls in place to ensure that that's not going to happen. And then we have an assurance that we have full segmentation between our web tier and our database tier in this case, when we're looking at this specific application. Now, uh, as we wrap things up here, um, what I'm really just going to really flash through uh, just to kind of give an idea is, you know, I touched on, you know, the intent dashboard and the various different intents. We're checking the status on those. We're looking at, you know, what's enabled, disabled. You can turn it intents on and off if you want. But when you click on define intent, this is where you can come in and you can use the intent engine to actually define various intents, depending on what infrastructure you're looking at. So we support things like stake. So I can look at, you know, account password protection, council access, default password existence. So we're actually looking across the devices, including third party vendors for default passwords to determine, you know, do we have a security issue? We're looking at the health. So, you know, looking at spanning tree for um, our, um, routing protocols for, you know, HSRP and VRP, uh, MTU mismatches, looking for duplex, duplicate IP address, uh, duplicate MAC addresses, as you can see, loop detection in the network. So you can come in and you can choose these intents, such as like a segmentation intent, and you can come over and you can click select. You can give the intent a name. You can define your source segment. This again could be a VM, an IP address. I can do a VLAN if I wanted to, um, and, and that I wanna check segmentation between two different VLANs as an example. So you can get very granular. You can choose your source, your destination, you can also choose the traffic direction you want this intent to, to run against. You can choose your severity level. And then down here where the notes are, you can actually come in, and this is where I can put in and leave notes for a network admin and says, if this intent fails, please contact so-and-so within this department, um, take this action as an example. Uh, it could be a reachability intent. So if let's say some data center interconnects go down, it could be notes saying, fail over to these interconnects if auto fail over doesn't occur as an example. So you can get pretty pretty granular in what you wanna include. So that way when the alert trips, they actually get the also the notes as to what action they should take or who should they contact. And then the, this is where you can come in and choose, do you wanna enable push notification? Do you want it to be emailed? And you can choose when you want it to be emailed, put in the email address or the aliases. And then you can also enable SNMP traps and you can choose where you wanna send those. And then what, you know, once you have the intent configured, you hit submit. And then that is actually now going to be uh, showing up inside the actual um, uh, intent dashboard and the system instantly starts checking against that as soon as you create that intent, because we already have all the data that we're pulling in the configuration data across the virtual and physical infrastructure. So it's analyzing that immediately and will tell you if that intent passes and fails. Wow. So that's what I'm gonna just go, go ahead. I just, I'm just like amazed at the the power that this has. I mean, I've seen like um, network vendors EMSs with you know le much less power than this and capability, um, and this with its its multi vendor support giving you that complete end to end picture. I mean, this is a really powerful tool. Absolutely, absolutely, and this continues to grow on the uh, what we're doing with the integrations and features that we're expanding here within 
the network insurance and verification feature sets in Be Realized Network Insight to help service providers and customers and of such. But with that, I'm going to go ahead and wrap this demo up. Yeah, Matt, that was, that, was, that was fantastic. Thank you very much for walking us through. And that's just one, one kind of portion of what the, uh, yeah. the solution can actually deliver, right? I mean, there's, there's the application assessment discovery that we didn't really discuss and plenty more in there. Okay, yeah, a lot well, of data that you can go and look at, so. And guided network troubleshooting and a whole bunch of other things as well. Yeah, I can see that this is probably one of those things that you deploy and then it will instantly give you, you know, highlight issues in your network that you didn't know about. Um, and, it, you know, the, the, the light bulb might go on and, and it, it's a great sort of system for doing that. Just, just plug it in, let it go. Um, yep. And like you say, a lot of it is out of the box already for you. Um, then obviously you can customize to your, to your needs. Um, Matt, thank you very much for that demo. That was really comprehensive. And, and just like I said, I think there's incredible power in this, this solution for service providers, just even if they want to use it for their own managed services, uh, sorry, for their own operations to improve yep. their services they provide to customers. But obviously you can see there um, that there's a great deal. If customers have got network teams that want to have access to this, there's a great deal of functionality you can provide them. And so, so Jung, thank you very much for uh, the presentation earlier on and walking us through some of the high level aspects of the solution. I think we'll do a, another one on the assessment and uh, you know more about the different areas of uh, Network Insight Cloud.